So um, I um, am the head of cytogenomics at Perkin Elmer Genomics, and I wanted to really talk about how we went ahead with validating the Sapphire technology, this tool, whole genome optical mapping, and especially for a very complicated disorder. So fascio-scapulohumeral muscular dystrophy, and for the remainder of the talk, I will be just saying FSHD, right? So this disorder is completely, uh, first of all, it's, uh, it's the third most common form of muscular dystrophy. And, wow, and um, the incidence, as you can see, is comparable with a lot of rare genetic disorders. Um, it, this disorder, especially if you look at this, this image over here, this is from one of the manuscripts, um, the, the symptoms are really classic. However, there is a lot of differential that we've seen in literature, you know, in publications, and if you, if you read through all the uh, families and, you know, the mode of inheritance. So, for example, spacular, uh, scapular winging and lower leg weakness, facial weakness, uh, retinopathy, atrophy of the upper arms, and then abdominal weakness. These are all some of the very common uh, symptoms of FSHD. However, this disorder, uh, there are two types, FSHD1 and FSHD2. And what you can see from this slide is that it's really complex. So let's go, you know, through one by one. Some of you must know uh, more about this, but let me just walk you through. So FSHD1, type 1, the incidence is in 95% of cases, and it's autosomal dominant inheritance. Compared to that, FSHD2 is only seen in 5% of cases, but that mode of inheritance is diagenic inheritance, and I'll just walk you through. So now you can see from the graph over here that the genetic basis of FSHD is also pretty complex. So what you see here, okay, so what you see here is are these 3.3 KB repeats, repeat arrays, and these are macro satellite, um, you know, markers over here. And, and what happens is that in the normal situation, you have 11 to 100 repeats or, or larger repeats. And in that situation, there is no um, uh, symptom, symptoms of FSHD. However, if there's a repeat contraction less than 10, then you will have FSHD expression happening in those patients. The catch here is, towards the end over here, there is a 10 KB polymorphic region, and so that actually determines the 4QA type or 4QB type. And so in comparison with, if you have the A polymorphism along with the repeat contraction, you will have FSHD. However, if you have a contraction on the B polymorphism, you will not have FSHD. Now this is compounded by another fact that chromosome 10 also has these D4Z4 repeats. So we need to differentiate somehow these, uh, the, the chromosome 4 from the 10 alleles, and that's where it becomes really difficult by next generation sequencing. Now, if you look at FSHD2, the gene here is on chromosome 18. It's called SMCHD1. And this gene, so you can have um, loss of function mutations or things like that, but the most important thing here is that this by itself, uh, by itself alone is, cannot cause FSHD. So what happens is that you've got these repeat contractions, but with the contraction, there's another twist. If you have a number less than six contractions, then it's fine. But what this actually does is if you have a repeat contraction between seven to 10, then what can happen is that this contraction actually also results into hypomethylation. And this hypomethylation becomes very important for chromosomes four and 10. So you will have FSHD2 only if you have the contraction on chromosome four along with the SMCHD1 mutation, and that will be FSHD2. But I took this screenshot from OMIM. So you can see that by itself alone, SMCHD1 will cause another autosomal dominant disorder. So that's where the complexity of an accurate diagnosis and using the right tools comes into play. So there are a number of publications, and I've highlighted uh, you know, a few very landmark papers. And you can see that the one on the top left was published in 1999, two decades ago. Okay. 
So we are talking about what are the classic methodologies, you know, southern blotting, methylation, and so on and so forth in an R&D setting, but, you know, used for accurate diagnosis. And then, of course, there's all the, these uh, publications on the open chromatin structure and the closed chromatin structure and how the duct spore hypomethylation along with the repeat contraction and how we see all these variations into expression. Keep in mind that there are some asymptomatic carriers with the repeat contraction which way, who do not have hypomethylation. That's why they are asymptomatic. So that's another thing that we need to tease out. And then, of course, I did need to highlight this article, which was published um, this year using BioNano's whole genome optical mapping technology. So why am I here, right? So let me give you a little introduction. So I'm part of Perkin Elmer Genomics, and we have a global laboratory network. We have um, labs in India, Malaysia, China, um, Solentuna, Sweden, and we have two labs in the US. And all the reporting directors are based in Atlanta. That's where I'm from. And our uh, vice president and chief scientific officer is Dr. Madhuri Hegde. And she is the, you know, renowned in the field of neuromuscular disorders and muscular dystrophy. So this disorder obviously was very, very important for us. And why it's important is because Perkin Elmer by itself has been a company that's been involved in a lot of screening, right? So we've got first trimester screening, newborn screening, and we now, as with Perkin Elmer Genomics, we are trying to complete the continuum of care. So we're going from screening to diagnostic to prognostic, and I want you to focus on here where we have the pediatric and adult and family disorders where we are trying to complete this whole picture with Perkin Elmer. So as I just mentioned, and you all heard from Sven, that, you know, uh, what all do we do? So Perkin Elmer Genomics, we have a very exhaustive uh, genomic test menu. So everything that you heard from Sven, you know, all, everything, whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing, mitochondrial genome sequencing, and, uh, but also, you know, these are the technologies that we use as part of our test menu. Uh, we also have a very comprehensive neuromuscular disorder next generation sequencing panel for, especially for uh, limb girdle muscular dystrophy, and we have an expanded panel. But for both of those panels, this disorder was something that we could not test because of the limitations that you just heard from Sven. So what we needed was a tool that could complement our whole genome sequencing or our next generation sequencing for FSHG testing to make this neuromuscular disorder, you know, gamut complete. And so that's where we have used Sapphire as the tool of choice, and I'm gonna walk you through how we did uh, laboratory uh, developed test validation in a CAPCLIA setting. So I will not go through this slide because Sven has already told you what exactly um, whole genome optical mapping approach is, but what I want to highlight is that thanks to Mark Barotkin, a.k.a. Mark Oldakowski. Did I pronounce that correctly, Mark? Okay. So now we have uh, the end focus FHD, uh, FSHD analysis tool. Now this is really important. So towards the end, I'll show you that, you know, instead of having, waiting 24 hours to get the report from our, from our data, now we can get the report especially focused on this, these two disorders and chromosome four, chromosome 10, and chromosome 18 in an hour and a half. And this is very important for a laboratory, you know, because we wanna get our reports out faster and, you know, beat the turnaround time and get the answers to the patients and families. Also, um, one unique thing is that this is a complete end-to-end uh, -end solution in three days. So in three days, you start from the sample to the report. And then, of course, you know, whatever analysis, interpretation, and how you want to draft your report. So again, to point out, this 1.5 hour is extremely important per sample instead of the 24 hours if we have focused approaches, uh, you know, using this tool. So uh, before I go into validation, I do want to talk about, because Sven just mentioned about the capabilities, and so this tool, this analysis tool, is extremely important, and we work together with Mark and his team. And what this essentially can do, because I explained to you what we are trying to do, so you are going to see a lot of tables now, so I want to explain to you what I'm talking about. So 
Can we differentiate between haplotype 4QA and 4QB? Yes. Also, can we measure the D4Z4 repeats? Yes, with accuracy. And also, can we also identify if there are any structural variants proximal to the D4Z4 locus? And also, any uh, SVs or microdeletions proximal to SMCHD1 on chromosome 18? And then can we see that, you know, from the QC perspective, how stable is this assay? Like, you know, from lab to lab, uh, reproducibility, repeatability, sample to sample, you know, do how much variation do we see? And then can we get a usable uh, clinical kind of like report with images so that everybody can understand what we are talking about in this complex disorder? So everybody here, they're used to, you know, either Sanger reads, Sanger traces, or arrays, or, you know, uh, if you are used to seeing that kind of data, then you can appreciate that if you, this is the normal um, uh, um, chromosome 4 locus with the D4Z4 repeat, and this is non-contracted, but then this is the contracted uh, allele. So everybody can see the contraction, right? I want to nod. Okay, yes. So this is how visual it is, and I'm going to show you one case in our validation where we had a mosaic profile, and you can then appreciate how beautiful this view looks, and you know, it's just screaming in front of your eyes, and you can just map the contractions and the repeats, and yes, so that's how, that's how easy it is, essentially. Um, so how we went uh, ahead with validation was that we needed a robust, um, you know, protocol because this is a com very complex disorder that we were trying to test. So we got Coriel uh, cell lines, six of those that have been well published in literature. And then we got three normal male samples and normal female samples because we want to make sure that nothing funky is going on. And then we got clinically diagnosed FSHD patients. And I have some images that I'm going to show you in a bit. And then, of course, everything that all the performance metrics that we need to test for an LDT validation, analytical specificity, sensitivity, accuracy, precision. And then we also did inter and intra site uh, reproducibility, thanks to uh, BioNano for uh, taking part in that. And then, of course, software optimization and reporting is, is extremely important from the reporting uh, you know, side. So these are the 14 uh, patients uh, that uh, were, you know, used in the study because the rest of the data will be pretty straightforward. What I just want you to remember are these two highlighted ones, uh, which is 773 and 918. And if you, and I'll keep reminding you about these. And this is um, patient number 11. And this was a family, a complete family. So the proband, the father, the uncle, and the grandfather. All four of them had classic FSHD symptoms. And so this is the, the image of the proband, and you can appreciate the uh, scapular winging profile, just classic. Um, so this is what we used as part of our clinical validation. And then one important thing that for every laboratory, for every assay, is that what are the QC metrics? Do we have appreciable QC metrics? So what you see, this beautiful image and these beautiful graphs, which none of the users will need to see, it's in the back. So if there are any issues that happen in your run with an assay, then you can go back and investigate. But this is nothing that you need to see. I'm just showing you that it's available. But what you will get in your report is the important things from a CAP perspective, right? So from the report, you get, OK, what was the enzyme used? Which was the instrument? Who was the operator? What was the chip ID? You know, everything for sample fidelity and integrity. Along with that, the inferred sex of the sample. Was there a sample mix up anywhere in the process? Along with that, the quality report, and then, of course, some other things that I think BioNano can answer better. And along with that, the uh, version of the software, the version of the analysis pipeline, and the date of the analysis. So it's completely robust. All this information you will get in, a, in your report. That's it? OK, I have to go really fast. So now you guys understood the, uh, the background. So we use these uh, six Coriel cell lines. And uh, of course, these are all published cell lines. So what we did was we did three runs of, on these six samples. And what we saw was that the repeat contractions, you can see MASH plus minus one contraction. 
And of course, not only the contracted allele, but also the other long allele, because as you heard from Sven, it's single molecules that are actually mapped here. And you can see the long molecules over here. So absolutely, everything matched perfectly. Along with that, the next thing was, okay, what's happening with our normal male and female samples? And you can see that all the samples showed the normal profile, and none of the control sa samples had the short 4QA allele. All of them had the long molecules, which is what we were expecting. So what happened with our, uh, those 14 clinically symptomatic for FSHD patients, right? So we ran these same samples at the BioNano site and also at perkin Elmer site, and I'm gonna show you both of them. And what you see here is that there were two samples where we did not see any repeat contractions. The rest of them, you can see the repeat contractions, two, three, five, seven, right? And then we have the other allele, and they were all on the 4QA background. The results matched exactly at, at uh, perkin Elmer site, but what you can see is one of them, we saw a potentially mosaic profile. And this is what I meant when you see the visualization, that here is your reference, this is your 4QA, and this is your 4QA other allele, and then you've got your 4QB. And you can see, because we have these three alleles, we are still in the process of confirming this mosaic profile, but it's absolutely very, very clear just from this visual that yes, we have these three alleles over here. And again, the, from the reproducibility perspective, what you can see is when we ran these same samples at perkin Elmer Genomics, and they were run by different people, completely blinded, and the data was put together later on, everything matched exactly the same. So going back to these patients, that, that 12 out of 14, we have been able to diagnose as FSHD1, and I'll talk about the other two in our future steps. Now, in any lab, you know, some, we have to have some learning lessons along the way. And the learning lesson along the way was that what we saw was that there were some molecule differences between BioNano and perkin Elmer Genomics, so we reran six of those samples uh, to see what was going on. And, but the haplotype and the repeat count did not change. And it was just a technical issue, it was a centrifugation issue, and which we realized later on, but the fact of the matter that I wanna point out over here is that from the repeat count perspective and the, uh, and the haplotype perspective, there was absolutely no change. So even if you have slightly suboptimal quality of data, this assay is pretty robust. You know, so, but we learned this, and we wanna make sure that other labs that adopt it also know that pay attention to centrifugation too, please. Okay, now what happened with all the other alleles? So obviously that was 4QA data. And you can see between the two sites, um, everything was exactly the same. So the 4QB allele and chromosome 10, which we were trying to discern, we were able to discern. And along with that, uh, so you can see the same results over here. And then, so to end this part, what did we see? We saw excellent reproducibility for assessing the D4Z4 repeat array on 4Q. Also regarding the precision, using the Coriel cell lines, the normal samples, and then the clinically symptomatic FSHD patients. We also were able to accurately map the 4QA and 4QB haplotype using this approach, and we were able to discern the 4Q and the 10Q D4Z4 arrays. And our Coriel cell line data had 100% concordance, and all the normal samples demonstrated the normal D4Z4 count. And of course, we still need to see that, you know, what's happening with the other two cases, uh, whether it's FSHD2 and that's something in development, but however, we had concordance between two different sites, two different instruments, two different operators using the same approach. So what our next step is that we are going to use the alternative conventional, one of the conventional methodologies to uh, ensure that what we have found by this uh, platform is absolutely the same. And we are also validating for large SMCHD1 deletions. So in fact, at perkin Elmer Genomics, we have our LGMD panel that I was talking to you about. And we've seen three cases of either a, uh, an entire chromosome 18p arm deletion or larger 18p deletions. So we are trying to get those samples to test those using uh, Sapphire. And also, uh, you know, develop the F FSHD2 methylation assay which is now on BioNano because they have some 
things in the pipeline that I'm really interested to implement, especially for the ranges of seven to 10 where hypomethylation is extremely important for the disease expression. And with Mark and his team, we are trying to finalize the reporting software tool and then launch FSHG testing at Perkin Elmer Genomics. Along with that, we are also looking at, uh, I don't expect any of you to read that table, but it's a list of other trinucleotide repeat disorders that we will be validating and we will try to see which one of those and how many of those, the di, the tri, the, the quad, the penta, the octa, the, the, whichever of those disorders are, how many of those we can validate using this tool. So uh, since Fen highlighted the booth 527, I actually don't even know what Perkin Helmer Genomics booth is. 1301? 1301. And so please come to the booth and we have this uh, coming soon uh, at Perkin Helmer Genomics. So you guys are getting a sneak peek of all the data that, and the work that was done at Perkin Helmer Genomics. And so I'll be happy to take any questions later. I guess I'm running out of time. So thank you everyone for your attention.